Know your neighborhood, the racetrack. The racetrack is the iconic North Bergen neighborhood, the section of town that nearly every resident knows, but most have no idea why it's called the racetrack. The area has a rich history, and it overshadowed by the infamous Guttenberg racetrack that operated there during the end of the 19th century. Today, the neighborhood streets are perfectly laid out in an ideal grid when compared to the rest of town. Starting at 81st Street and ending at 91st Street, this neighborhood is locked between Bergen Line Avenue and Kennedy Boulevard. It is interconnected by five tree-lined avenues, with most of the original 1920s era construction still standing. The racetrack is the most recognizable and sought-after neighborhood in North Bergen. Prior to the racetrack and what we know today, the area was a part of the Bergen Woods, a heavily forested and mostly uninhabited part of North Bergen. There were no roads leading in or out but around it. The work needed to cultivate the land too high of an investment. But that would all change in 1885. The track was originally constructed under the supervision of Philip Hexamer, brother of Major William Hexamer. It served the North Bergen Driving Park Association for the residents of Hudson County to race their horses. The track was unaffiliated with any racing organization, a real locals only kind of place. They set their own standards for track conditions. It was a simple half mile track and lacking of any accommodations for visitors. At the time of its creation, it was dubbed an outlaw track. Shortly after its creation, John Carr, a former justice of the peace and well-known croupier, leased the track. Carr formed the Hudson County Jockey Club with the help of three very powerful friends. County clerk Dennis McLaughlin was known as the moving spirit behind the track and was one of the most politically influential men in Hudson County and right hand to Governor Leon Abbott. There was Nicholas Crucius, a New York liquor dealer. Lastly, there was Gottfried, the Dutch Fred Walbaum, an established powerful bookmaker and infamous gambler. The big four, as they were known, were demonized in the press after their purchase of the track. The spirit painted them as a few German and Celtic politicians who openly boast they are above and beyond the law. The New York Sun said they ran the track as absolutely as a Tsar dominates Russia. A very dated statement in today's world, but quite insightful to the men who operated the track. The track brought in roughly $5,000 a day for the big four. At any race, you could find 20 to 30 bookmakers. The bookmakers were charged $100 a day to work the track. Purses as large as $3,000, $85,000 today, drew very large crowds to the track, but there were usually won by someone in the know. You could also place bets on any race at any track in the country there, a first for the area. The track was expanded in 1889 to a full mile course. In addition, a heated grandstand was built with a glass front to protect patrons from the elements during winter races. The same grandstand saw on a week about 3,000 visitors, while on a weekend of holiday could hold up to 12,000 people. The Times called it first class, bested only by the newly built Morris Park, as good as track as there is in the country. There was also a two-story clubhouse that could accommodate 400 people. Admission to the track was $1, $28 today. The Big Four made so much money in the course of a year that Wabaum was able to purchase 90% of ownership of the Saratoga racetrack for $375,000, $10.6 million today in 1890. The gut, however, was not a place for the soft-skinned. The Tribune reported, Guttenberg in their hands, the Big Four, a thieves' paradise. The felons of New York, Brooklyn, Jersey City, Newark, and other cities made the Guttenberg track their place of rendezvous and their headquarters. Never was a more odious and detestable travesty of racing that which was carried on among the sharpers, the sneak thieves, and the buccaneers of Guttenberg. The Big Four added former assemblyman John Patrick Feeney to be the track superintendent. Feeney was also the law of the track, but more importantly and interesting to the level of corruption, he was also a detective for the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office and the president of the Jersey City Board of Police Commissioners. Given his position at the track and in law enforcement, Feeney led raids against gambling houses and those who opposed not only the track, but the Hudson County political machine. They also ran a very advanced betting rink. Under the direction of Crucius, the track would print 100,000 clubhouse badges and spread them not just throughout Hudson County, but throughout the tri-state area. Wabam stated that 
they'd be in every barber shop, delicatessen store, fruit stand, all done not only to advertise the track, but encourage betting at the track. As for the clientele that frequented the track, racing historian Stephen A. Rice described the patrons as such. Guttenberg's audiences were mainly thugs and other disorderly characters, including Hoboken and Jersey City liquor dealers, ordered by McLaughlin and his friends to bet there instead of the Harrison or Newark betting parlors. The New York Times gave this description. People who dared not show their faces in New York City during the daytime for fear of police recognition and arrest. The Big Four and the Gut would face pushback in 1892 from the Law and Order League. They made daily arrest, typically bookmakers. It was so bad that on several occasions, Pinkerton agents were sent to make arrests. However, the Big Four in particular, Wabam had several very powerful friends in Hudson County, so much that they came to his defense and actually opposed the Law and Order League's inquiries to the track. The track, overall, however, never really held quality races. It served more as a training ground for horses that would go on to win major stakes. Most of the races were considered low quality, where jockeys rode second-rate horses. The most famous horses to run at Guttenberg were the Timani, the 1893 Horse of the Year, and the Lamplighter, a young upstart. The race between the two drew 15,000 spectators. Timani easily won by several lengths in the one and quarter mile race. Outside of this race, the track was famous for running horses year-round in any weather condition. Races were held in snowstorms, sub-zero temperatures, and fog that blanketed the track. The New York Times reported on one such race. The race was run in a blinding snowstorm. When a foghorn blew, the people in the glass hot house that they called a grandstand knew the race had started, but they could only see absolutely nothing. These races would be the Achilles heel of the track. The track introduced two-year-old racing, which the press attacked the owners for as the horse bodies were not strong enough for that type of running. Along with the pushback from the racing community, the outrageous amounts of arrests made at and near the park caused the town of North Bergen to keep a watchful eye on the track. But it was the state of New Jersey that put an end to racing at the Guttenberg track. In 1893, the state legislator considered sending the state militia to North Bergen to shut down any winter racing taking place. The Big Four used every connection that they had to try and sway the state, but it was to no avail. Reformers had taken control of the state, and under extreme public pressure, they abolished all horse racing in New Jersey. Outside of the Big Four and their legacy, there is one person that was a larger-than-life figure. Agnes Sennett was dubbed the Queen of Guttenberg, or known among the patrons of the track as Queen Ag. Agnes was a fixture at the gut. The track itself, already something out of lore and grandeur in town history, and Agnes Sennett exemplified it. Agnes and her husband James were very active at the track, both as patrons and for running horses there. The Senates owned numerous racehorses, most famously Eclipse, Dr. Williams, and R. Johnny. It is claimed that R. Johnny once won the Senates one of the biggest purses of the track's history, $80,000. The track did have some life after horse racing. Post-horse racing, the track hosted automobile racing. The Detroit Public Library has a great series of images that show what the track looked like circa 1910, but most of the original structures are still standing and show what a draw the track still was. The track and surrounding area was used by early aviators as a runway, which seemed almost impossible to imagine today. However, the days of excitement were numbered for the track and its new tenants. A fire described as a spectacular blaze that illuminated the river and was clearly seen from Manhattan destroyed the grandstand, clubhouse, and surrounding buildings. By 1919, the land that once housed one of the most corrupt racing institution in the state was lauded, divided, and sold for development. Today, the quiet, tree-lined streets of the racetrack show no signs of its once rambunctious past. The old-timers we know today only remember what the old-timers of their youth recalled of the track. Today, we look at the track as everything the era stood for, elegance, extravagance, and wealth when in reality it was a corruptly run money-making scheme for some of the most influential men of the time. What is left of the track is only hearsay and legends. The Hudson County Jockey Club was moved and turned into James Vincent Bicycles. Parts of the grandstand were recycled into a home built on 84th Street. Third Avenue was laid right on top of the track. For the last hundred years, the racetrack section of North Bergen has been and continues to be one of the most sought-after real estate markets in town. 
That said, it still holds true to the idea of North Bergen having a small town feel where you get to know your neighbors. Home to two of the oldest businesses in town, Hanson Brothers and James Vincent Bicycles, a North Bergen institution like Atlas Drugs that has serviced the community for generations called a racetrack home as well, where North Bergen's Italian heritage is still very evident with eateries like La Sorrentina, Roma Pizzeria, and De Palma Brothers. Places like Harry's Food and Drink, Tapas de España, and Blanc have been added a new breath of life into the neighborhood. Lastly, you can stroll the avenues to see original architecture of the 1920s with Dutch colonials, colonial revivals, and American Foursquare and modern English homes lining now tranquil streets of the racetrack.